Well, let's, let's look at the word now. God is good. I invite you to stand and take your Bibles. Turn with me to Luke, the fifth chapter. Luke chapter 5, we stand for the reading of God's word. Angels bow at the voice of God and human beings stand. Mm, I feel like preaching already. So when angels bow, we stand. And when we bow, they stand. Oh, you're not hearing me. When we bow in prayer, they stand around his throne. So Luke chapter 5 and verse 17. The Bible declares, and it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. But when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and led him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Verse 25. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed and glorified God. And they were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, Don't talk about it. Be about it. Look at your other neighbor and say, Don't talk about it. Just do it. Please be seated. Father God, into thy hands I commit my spirit, and into thy hands I commit my mind, and into thy hands I commit my mouth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can I take my time and teach you before I preach to you? It is critical to understand purpose and intent when we evaluate actions and words. It's critical to understand why a person does what they do or say what they say because if you don't understand purpose, and if you don't understand intent, then you are prone to misinterpreting and drawing wrong conclusions. Are you with me? So the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they have a divine purpose. And that divine purpose is to expose us and indicate to us that Jesus Christ, who came out of the womb of a virgin named Mary, that this Jesus lived in a real place, walked on a real earth, performed real miracles, the purpose of the Gospels, when you read them, is to let you know that Jesus is Lord. Mm. 
It's interesting as we read these Gospels that they don't take time to mention the clothes. Oh, I'm, I'm going. They don't talk about the clothes that he wears. There, there is no mention of, of, of the house that he lived in. There is no mention of his educational pedigree. Because as far as the gospel writers are concerned, that's irrelevant to who he is. It doesn't matter what he wears and where he lives and who his daddy and mommy is. That doesn't matter. They're introducing you to who he is, not what he has, not... Mm. It, 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 this is critical. Because oftentimes we spend so much time evaluating each other's worth. Oh, and evaluating uh, each other's significance based on what they wear and the car they drive and the house that they live in and the degrees behind their name and the size of their bank account and their social standing in society. We value people based on things that God says. And so when, he's, when, when the gospel writers are introducing us to Jesus, they, they make all of that irrelevant. Because at best, when I have all of that as a creature, I can't impress the creator. Oh no, oh, I'm, oh, oh, I can't impress the creator with my social standing and, and my money and my education. I can't impress the creator. He made me. He gave me that which I have. So I can't impress him. So the only people I can impress are other creatures. And what's the point of impressing other creatures? You're made just like me, so you think highly of me. So what? Oh, Jesus. I, oh, I, mm, you didn't want me in here today. <laughs> creatures impressing other creatures. So you're pretty. But you're still dust. So you just happen to be pretty dust. And if you're ugly, <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're just ugly dust. Because at the end of the day, we as creatures are all dust. Dressed up dust. I'm getting to health. Don't, I'm going there. It, it, it is not by chance. It is not by chance that God selected the material that he did in the formation of man. Uh, are you listening? He selected a material that was degradable and combustible. If God... And, and this is how God is good. His omniscience, his foreknowing causes him to see today and tomorrow all at the same time. Therefore, there is nothing that comes to him by surprise. And before we sinned, he knew that sin was coming. Therefore, he made preparation for the sin that was coming. Even in the material that he chose when he knelt down by the bank of the river, even the selection of the material was divinely ordained. He could have made you out of granite. You know, you hear me. You know, you hear me. You know, you know, you're not hearing me. He could have made you out of marble. He could.
could have made you out of indestructible diamonds as precious. I'm going to touch. You can move. I'm going to touch. He could have made you out of something indestructible. But if you were indestructible, you would have been an everlasting sinner. Oh, somebody ought to hear me. So he knew that sin was going to come. So he prepared a form that would eventually fade away. It's critical. Nothing happens by chance with God. Everything, he says, before you came from your mother's womb, I formed you, I created you, I made you, I ordained you. Before your entrance into the world, I purposed you. So here's, here's the problem. When sin entered into the world, it brought a escalated demise of the human race. And sin wreaked havoc on our bodies. Sin is universal. And the impact of sin must therefore be universal. There is no Special Adventist sickness. Come on, you're not, hold on. There is no specific Adventist disease process. Therefore, since sickness and illness is universal, the solution has to be universal. Are, are you, you're not going to like this. You're, you're not going to like this. Because we seem to think that even though the problem is universal, only we have the solution. Jesus. Jesus. Why would God limit the solution to a universal problem Why would God limit the solution to a universal problem to one group of individuals? Worse, that group of individuals are not even doing with... They're not even using what they know and have. So that's why we find that now, back in the day when I was growing up as a little child in Jamaica, we, we, we had the five-day stop smoking plan, and, and we were the only ones running. Now, everybody's talking about smoking cessation and, and proper eating and drinking. and Look here. We started cereals and and green and granola yeah. 
What did we do with it? So here's the problem. The Bible says that, that Jesus on a certain day, and it doesn't specify the day. It just says on a certain day he was in somebody's house. And as his evangelistic tendencies are, he went into the person's house to teach and preach. It was not his intent to do and perform any miracles. He, he went there to preach and to teach. And he went to engage in intellectual exchange with the Pharisees and the scribes and to, and to let them know the errors of their way and to point them in the right direction. Hmm. That was his intent. But sometimes our intent, though it may be good, its relevance at the time makes it bad. So he intended to teach, and that's good. But God never wants us to limit what we do based on our preconceived notions and ideas. You know, listen. Sometimes we limit what God can do because we have a preconceived intent and agenda. And when you have a preconceived agenda and plan and ideology and philosophy, oftentimes, even though it may be good, if it's not what God wants at that time. But the difference between Jesus and you and me, you see, I got to, is he was flexible. I, 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 my, my, my. He, he, he was flexible. He was flexible to the yielding. And molding of the Holy Ghost. There's nothing wrong with having plans preacher for your church. There's nothing wrong with having a five year plan and an agenda for your church. But are you flexible? Are you willing to move as the spirit says move and go where the spirit leads? There's nothing wrong with being the health director, but are you flexible? Or do you feel this is my program? This is how it's got to be. And if it's not... <sighs> but Jesus was flexible. Because he was not so in love with his own ideas that he was not open to the working of the Spirit of God. So the Bible says the Spirit of God came upon him to heal. Even though he wanted to teach, the Spirit came to heal. And being flexible, being malleable, being movable, Some of us are just way too rigid for God to use us. I, you're not listening to me. Some of us are just way too rigid for God to move and use us. You'll notice as you survey scripture. 
It's only in the Old Testament that you find the erection of monuments. So, so, so Jacob has a dream and he sees a ladder stretching from earth to heaven. And in this place, he erects a monument. Abraham erects a monument at the place of the sacrifice of his son, the sacrifice that didn't happen, you know. When you get to the New Testament, you don't find any erection of monuments. Because the church is not to be centered around anything that is not mobile. The church is not to be centered around anything that is not dynamic and able to change. So that's why he can say you must go into all the world. Because if you're locked in, you can't go. Oh, preacher, 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 preacher. If you're locked in. If you're bound up, tied up, anchored down, you can't go. If you are too invested in buildings, Jesus, and conference offices, and you can't go. Say preach. I need encouragement. Say preach. I don't need a whole lot, just a little bit. You <laughs> and watch what happens. He enters into the man's house and, and, and when he first starts out, he's talking with the scribes and, and the Pharisees and he's exchanging intellectual ideas and philosophies and theology. And the house is able to contain the inhabitants and the occupants in the house. But, hold on. When the spirit of healing came upon him and the word got out that if you came into the house, if you came in with diabetes, if you came in with arthritis, if you came in with high blood pressure, if you came in with breast cancer, if you came in with uterine cancer, prostate cancer, brain tumor, if you came in to the house where Jesus is, you will not leave the same way. And when the folks heard, When the folks heard, when they heard that you could be healed of your bodily diseases, when they heard there was no room. There was no room. Because everybody, everybody, black, white, yellow, brown, rich, poor, bond free, needs healing. It has no social stratification. It has no educational limitation. Everybody, the doctor himself, You see, you see, can, can, can I go back and teach a little? You see, while the spiritual is the most important because the flesh will die, 
It's made of dust. <laughs> While the spiritual is the most important, the recognition of the spiritual is the least relevant to the mind. You're not hearing me. <laughs> While my soul is the most important thing, my awareness that my soul is in need is the least is the least thing on our minds. Most of us don't even really, 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 especially those brought up in the Adventist church through the years, and you never went out there and, and what, what, you know, drank and smoked. And, 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 you don't even feel you're all that bad. I, I'm not, I, don't know, I don't know who I'm talking to. I, I'm just preaching to some real folks. You don't even really think you're that bad. So our cognition of our spiritual deficit is low. But everybody knows when they're sick. Oh, you're not hearing me. L listen, listen, you, you think this thing is, is by chance, I told you. That pain that you get in your head reminds you that you're dust. The diagnosis that you receive from the doctor makes you fully aware So since everybody has some physical need at some point, that's why it is critical that when we are doing what we do, that we don't put the health message and healing in the back. Lord have mercy, stop it. You're not hearing me. You see, you see, we, we lay this thing down as a one-day thing, and we have done our obligations according to the general conference. The, the, the Bible says that when he started, when the folks knew that you could get healing in the house, they didn't need to pitch a tent. They didn't need no crusade and, 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 and 2,000 this and two. They didn't need none of that. So when you have health day, that's really when you should bring in all the visitors that you can find for them to come and get healing. If you really believe that there is healing in the house. Now if you don't believe there's healing in the house, then don't bring them. But if you believe that you can be healed in the house, and you bring them to the house so they can be healed. And there's no reason why you shouldn't believe that healing can occur in the house. Because if Jesus is in the house... If Jesus is in the house, healing must. You see, you see, Jesus doesn't have to touch, say a word, just got to stand in the house. Oh, all he's got to do is just stand in the house. And he's always in the house. Uh, there is no time that he's not in the house. If he's not in the house, then you better get out the house. So since he's always in the house, and where he is, there is healing. Watch this. The presence of God, His presence, alters, always alters everything that is around Him. Mm, mm. The, the, the presence of God, 
transforms the natural into the supernatural. The natural cannot remain natural when the supernatural enters in. When the supernatural enters in, the natural order and sequence of the natural must change. Are you with me? That's why he can say no weapon formed against you can prosper because when God is in you, he alters the natural consequence of those weapons that were meant for destruction. He now turns it. Because the presence of God changes the natural from its ordained or predetermined course and changes it so that's why some of your enemies intending to curse you end up blessing you ah that's because uh. when god gets in it he he changes it he enters into a bush and, and instead of the fire, because God is in the bush, instead of the fire being consumptive, the fire becomes a preservative. Are you listening to me? God gets in the bush and preserves. Alters the natural configuration and consequence of the element. He enters into the, into the lion's den and transforms the lions from carnivores to vegetarians. He, he, when, when God gets in it. When God gets in it. Your enemies can talk about you. But when God gets in it. Your boss may be needling you, trying to get you to do something so that he could fire you. But when God is in you, oh, oh, what you see, what would normally make you get upset and normally cause you to react because God is in you, you don't even hear it. Do you know how many times, how many miracles God does on a daily basis? He not just, he doesn't only unblock deaf ears. Sometimes he blocks God not only opens the eyes of the blind, sometimes he shuts them. So you can't see what they really wanted to do. So you can't hear. How many times have you been in a situation, somebody said something, did something, in the immediate, you didn't realize what was going on. And then when you left, you said, but wait. That was God. Because if you had heard and if you had seen, you'd have said something, done something. Sometimes he, sometimes he even confuses our mind. You're not hearing me. Sometimes he confuses your mind and reduces your, your deductive capacity so you can't really figure out until afterwards and all of a sudden your cognitive abilities return and you can figure out what was really being done. Every now and then he put like Alzheimer's. Every now and then he put like a dementia. You know, no, I'm... Are you, Oh, I don't know if I have some real people up in here, but, but that's what God does. He, he makes you forget. We all, we all better get a little touch every now and then. Just don't go on no meds, but get some. So the spirit of healing comes and, 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 and all of a sudden... The house is full. There's no room. When he was preaching and teaching, there was room. But when, when, when healing was occurring, there was no more room. And watch this. The greatest hindrance to the healing of the man on the bed with the palsy 
was not the door, was not the window. The issue wasn't whether Jesus was in the house. Jesus is always in the house. The issue is never, never his presence, but accessibility. Can, can, can you get to him? Accessibility. Can we get to him? It's not if he's there, but is he accessible? And we put up so many barriers to accessibility, not availability. Oh, Jesus, I, I could just stay there and preach for a little bit right there. Because mm. he's always available, but he's not always accessible because we, we. So, so, so some folks had got their blessing and had come in. And instead of getting their blessing, come in and go. They... They, they, they got their blessing and stayed and became a preventative block for any future blessing to anybody else. So the greatest hindrance to the blessing to the man with the palsy was not the doors or the windows, but the very people in the... It was the very people in the house that blocked him. From getting to Jesus, people who told him, you can't come in because you're not dressed. Hold on, hold on. Oh, oh. Uh, you, you, you can't come in because you, you don't look right. You, you can't kim, come in because you don't believe the Sabbath. You can't come in. And they're waiting to come in. But we've got so many rules and restrictions as to how you ought to look and act. <sighs> that you can't make room. But I've got news for you. Oh, you ought to hear me right now. I, I got news for you. Because when God is ready to bring them in, he will bring them in. And you better move out of the way. You better step aside because he's going to bring them in. And he's going to bring them in with such huge numbers. They may run you over. And all your little doctrinal correctness, he's going to push aside. Excuse me. All your restrictions, excuse me. All your form and fashion, excuse me. I need Jesus. <laughs> and so the Bible says that his friends would not be deterred because their need was greater than their circumstance. Somebody ought to understand. You got to understand. When your need is greater than your obstacle, when your need is greater than your circumstance, when your need is greater than your blockers, when your need is greater than your haters, I don't know if I had anybody in here who's got a need that's bigger than your situation, greater than your circumstance. I don't know what you're going through, but when your need is so great that you can't wait for Wednesday night prayer meeting. Oh, oh. You, by faith, will press and will by any means necessary. There's nothing worse than a desperate man. You got to hear me. When you're desperate, <laughs> in fact, oh man, th th this is going to get good. So, so can, I, can I break this down theologically? So this, this revelation just came to me. God's greatest creative accomplishments occurred in the face of chaos are you listening no man you don't get it yet 
God's greatest creative exhibition always occurs from the very beginning in the midst and in the face of chaos. So the earth ooh, was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God in the midst of the extreme situation, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the nothingness, in the midst of it all, God then intervenes and creates. He creates light out of the darkness. He creates form out of that which had no form. He creates calm out of chaos. You got to understand when you are in your most extreme, that's when the creative capacity of God goes to work so Satan is a fool you, you know you hear me because he thinks that the more chaos and more negative situations he puts you in he thinks that the more turmoil and the more heartache and the more stress he brings into your life, he thinks that that will cause you to abandon God. But he's a fool and a liar because when you are the most stressed out and when you, that's when God is going to be the most creative and he's going to make a way out of no way. So my enemies become a blessing. You know, hear me. Because my enemies release the creative power of God. My negative situation causes the positive flow of God. Somebody ought to just praise him for that alone. Just praise him for that alone. That's why he says, I make your enemies. Because what your enemies are actually doing, instead of putting you down, because the footstool elevates you, you don't know that. The footstool is elevated. Uh -huh. All right. Enough. I'm tired. Why? Why is that surprising? I'm the one running up and down. Y'all sitting down up here. Y'all, y'all sitting. I'm the one. I'm the one running up and down all over the place. Thank you. You know. Thank you. And they ministered. So what we need to pray for is for the Spirit of God to come in this house and do miracles of healing of both mind, body, and spirit. Let me, let me lay this last nugget on you and I'm going to sit down. Remember I started out by saying that it's, it's critical to understand purpose. Why we do what we do or why somebody says what they say or purpose is critical. Because if I don't understand purpose, the reason behind something, then I will either misinterpret or not fully understand what is being done. Let me give you an example. So a couple weeks ago, I'm upstairs in... In, uh, in one of the clinics and, and uh, a lady comes up and she has two children with her and as soon as she got to my area the security guards came and 
the administrative, the clinic administrators came and, and they said, Doc, we need to talk to you. I said, okay, what's going on? So she said, this lady, uh, I want you to see the, the young child, but this lady can't leave. I said, why? She said, because there was an incident. What was the incident? Say after me, you got to know purpose. So her daughter, who's a seven-year-old, is autistic. And this autistic child down in the lobby before she came up to my clinic was running around and acting up and, you know, throwing herself on the ground and, and so on. So the mother of this child grabbed her and shook her and said, stay still. Somebody, oh Jesus, somebody got on the phone and called 911 and reported a case of child abuse. I'm I'm taking you home. I'm going to deal with you and then you come back. So, so, so the police, the security guards came and the police came. And the mother is in tears because now they're going to call the ALS, whatever they call them. A, yeah, they're going to call all, and, and the mother with the officers and, and the clinic people, got in a room and she told them the history. And they said, oh. And they apologized to her. But she had to go through all of that. Because somebody didn't understand the purpose. So remember I told you that, that, that things in the Bible is for a purpose. And the purpose of all of scriptures from Genesis all the way to Revelation is very simple. It's to let you know who God is and because of who he is, he does what he does. The most significant thing of the nature of God as to who he is and the reason why all these miracles that are told in the Bible have any relevance is because of the sameness it is the invariability it is the sameness it is the immutability it is the reproducibility of God let me, let me forget them words there. Watch this. <laughs> it is the sameness of God. The same God who healed 2,000 years ago is the same God that heals today. The same God who raised people from the dead years ago is the same God today. The same God who gave sight to the blind is the same God today. It is the sameness of God. You can count on him. He's the same one now as then. The same one that went into the tomb is the same one that came out of the tomb. Because if he is not the same, Lord have mercy. If he is not the same, then what's the point of telling me all that he did before? Yes. I, 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 there's no point in telling me how he gave sight to the blind and what he did, how he walked on water, how he calmed the seas. There's no point in telling me those things if he is different now. Yes. That's the most important thing. Because it's that sameness that enables me to trust him in my sameness. <laughs> it is his sameness that enables me when I'm going through my storm to know that I can trust him to get me through.
All right, stand to your feet. trying to say to the hills from where the music and music had thrown me off a little bit hold on I'm losing my song what's my song help me sing it Lord I will live my your grace your blessing your goodness and your love it's undeserved but you give it anyway you shower it down upon us in our dry places and today oh God we're reminded of your goodness and your greatness we're reminded of your healing capacity and power we're reminded oh God that you are able no matter what our situation and our circumstance you're able to change that just by your presence you don't even have to speak a word, just step in it. And when you're in it, our situations will change. We pray, oh God, that you'll come into our minds and you'll come into our bodies and whatever disease processes we're going through and experiencing, come in, oh God, whether it be cancer or diabetes or heart-related issues, come in, our oh God. Make, make a change inside us so that we can glorify you we thank you for this day we thank you for the revelation and the manifestation of the Holy Ghost in this place and until that day may we continue this day in your love in your grace and in your mercy until that day when we see you face to face in Jesus name Amen
Amen, church.